of you Either judging laptops, and watching a debate the from an impartial yeah. perspective as opposed to being up here. Okay, you'll see some things that they do that you will question, write them down. Uh, we're going to have a section of why did you do this in this way? Why didn't you do this in that way? We'll have an opportunity for you to interact with them as well. Does that make sense to everyone? So you will get to ask questions at the end of the debate. Uh, Todd Lipford, our national champion, although he's not the only. I think it's time to formally move on to stop making fun of Todd, whatever that means about national championship after all this time, to move to Josh Roberts, who is also a national champion. There you go. I thought you would appreciate that. But uh, he's going to take over. He is the moderator. This is now their show. All right. Well, welcome. Um, first of all, I don't think any of you need your computer out. You should all be going to sleep. My bus, there's a lab leader. Yeah, it's okay. it's My lab, I have a discussion question out for them. So in between speeches, uh, please, if it's okay. I trust uh, one boy. Oh, oh. Okay. None of you should be on anything other than school as you're on your computer. You should yes. be flowing on paper. Um, first of all, you always need to get better at flowing on paper because not all judges like it when you're on your computer anyways in rounds. So it's something that you should practice. My handwriting's awful. You'll get to see that in a minute. Um, but uh, Mr. Timmons brought up the fact that you were going to be writing your RFDs. I'm just going to say this now because everyone always forgets that. Um, don't write your RFD on your flow because I'm sure your lab leaders are going to be doing some stuff that has you needing to have space on your flow and stuff like that. I know the kids in my lab are going to be doing some things with that. So make sure when you do the RFD at the end of the round, you do it on a separate sheet of paper or something like that. Um, okay, so I know like we're kind of dealing with everyone from every different lab, but what I want all of you guys to do before we start the round is pick a specific goal. You might have discussed this with your lab leaders, you might have been thinking about this, like this might be something that you've been trying to work on for a while. Anyways, I know some of you are just new to learning how to flow, so um, that can be your goal to like try and do the best flow that you can, uh, that you can do. It can be uh, like your goal to like try and guess what the affirmative strategy is going to be before... I didn't know you that. Okay. He broke it. Um, so anyway, uh, like just come up and just come up with something that you have a very particular goal in mind that you can use this uh, use this demo round to help you learn about. Then second of all, I'm going to be uh, or third of all, sorry, I'm going to be talking to you in between every speech, and we're going to be talking about strategies and like what we think is going to happen, what like just did happen, and stuff like that. Um, the last thing I want to say is when you're flowing, um, something you're going to want to keep in mind is you don't want to write out the word rehabilitation or retribution every time you hear it because you're going to hear it a lot. So just make sure that you're using appropriate, uh, like you're just trying to shorten those things down. And referring to retribution as R or rehabilitation as R isn't going to work. Cause, so. um, I'm, I'm just going to do RH and RT, but like, do whatever works for you. I'm going to flow. You should be able to follow along that. <laughs> um, I'm going to flow. You should be able to follow along. Um, it doesn't have to look anything like anything like my flow at all. Just try to make sure that you're taking notes. Don't get dis discouraged if you miss a bit. I miss bits when I'm uh, like when I'm flowing too from time to time. It happens like because like it just happens. But try to get everything. Don't get discouraged. And I think this is going to be a great round. So let's give it up for both the people today. <laughs> I'm sure your lab leaders will at the very least have, have access to them, so uh, you can get through that. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Is everybody ready? Speak up. Speak up? Yeah. Okay. Louder. Wow, that's really loud. I can't hear you. Clear. Okay. Clear. <laughs> National champ. Let's go. All right. I affirm resolve. Rehabilitation ought to be valued above retribution in the United States criminal justice system. Because the resolution is a question of competing government policies, the negative must provide a comparative advocacy. Not defending an alternative would skew ground because it allows the negative to pick a small issue with a certain policy while forcing the affirmative to defend perfection. Comparing world's best divides grounds where burdens for both the affirmative and the negative are reciprocal. Reciprocity is key to fairness because it allows both debaters an equal chance of winning. 
Mark Lipsy defines rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is aimed at motivating, guiding, and supporting constructive change in whatever engenders criminal behavior. It is not defined by sanctions. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, involves exercises and instructions designed to alter the dysfunctional thinking patterns exhibited by many offenders. I value justice because the resolution questions the justice of an action within the context of the criminal justice system. When harm is inevitable, we must rationally accept our position and reframe the moral question. Samuel Scheffler, professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley writes, in our hypothesis, someone is going to be violated. Either A1 will harm P1, or five agents will identically harm P2 through P6. Either way, some inviolable person is violated. An appeal to the value of an unviolated life or the disvalue of the violation of a life cannot possibly provide a satisfactory answer to this question. The question is not whether to choose an unviolated life over a violated one. The choice is between one person inflicting a, rel a relatively small number of violations and five other persons inflicting a relatively larger number of violations of equal weight from an impersonal standpoint. Deontology always collapses into an ends-based view of justice because side constraints are, are chosen on the basis that they secure some greater end like pleasure. We can't measure negative rights violations without imposing a conception of the good. Therefore, the criterion is protection of rights. While all rights are important, the right to life comes first because it is a temporal prerequisite to all other rights. Contention one is that rehabilitation is effective at reducing crime. The most comprehensive studies prove that even the lowest mean reduction in recidivism for rehabilitation are greater than the best results that sanctions could produce. Lipsy and Colin write. This review has attempted to catalog every meta-analysis that has been conducted on the study of correctional interventions. First, every meta-analysis of study that compare recidivism outcomes for offenders receiving greater versus lesser or no sanctions has found at best modest mean recidivism reductions for the greater sanctions, and at worst, increased recidivism for that condition. Second, every meta-analysis of large samples of studies comparing offenders who receive rehabilitation treatment with those who do not has found lower mean recidivism for those in the treatment conditions. The least of those mean reductions is greater than the largest mean reduction reported by any meta-analysis of sanction. Nearly all the meta-analysis of studies of specific rehabilitation treatments or approaches show mean recidivism reductions, and the great majority of those are greater than the largest reduction found in any meta-analysis of sanctions. And rehabilitation is effective at reducing recidivism. Meta-analysis proves. Landenberger et al. right. Several well-conducted meta-analyses have identified cognitive behavioral therapy as a particularly effective intervention for reducing the recidivism of juvenile and adult offenders. Pearson, Lipton, Cleland, and Yee conducted a meta-analysis of 69 research studies covering cognitive behavioral programs. They found with a mean recidivism reduction for treated groups of about 30%. Similarly, a meta-analysis by Wilford, Buford, Wilson, Buford, and McKinsey examined 20 studies of group-oriented cognitive behavioral programs for offenders and found that CBT was very effective for reducing their criminal behavior. And prefer meta-analytic evidence to isolated studies or individual examples of failure. Colin and Gindrow write. There are advantages to using the meta-analytic technique to organize research findings. First, meta-analysis can detect the effects that traditional narrative or ballot box reviews fail to capture. By summing effect sizes across a sample of studies, regardless of their statistical significance, meta-analysis avoids this problem. Second, it is possible to assess whether methodological factors influence the size of a treatment effect by introducing them into multivariate analysis. Contention two. Retributive philosophy masks the social, economic, and political underpinnings of crime. Holding individuals exclusively accountable and blameworthy for their offenses prevents adequate repara reparation of the injustices that fuel criminal behavior. Jeffrey Ryman writes, Focusing on individual guilt diverts our attention from the possible evils in our institution, but it puts forth half the problem of justice as if it were the whole problem. To look only at individual criminality is to close one's eyes to the social injustice. Justice is a two-way street. By focusing on individual responsibility for crime, the criminal justice system literally acquits the existing social order of any charge of injustice. This means that when the system holds an individual responsible for a crime, it is implicitly conveying the message that the social condition in which the crime occurred are not responsible for the crime. By holding the individual responsible, it literally acquits the society of criminality or injustice. 
Instead, the government should take responsibility for the social condition that it has allowed and the role it has played in creating those conditions. Hudson concludes the affirmative case. Rehabilitation should be an obligation on the state because this is the only way in which it could be effective. Choices are constrained by circumstances and under certain social conditions, people will turn to crime who in other social climates will remain law abiding. Poverty, social and material inequalities lead people into crime. The state should recognize its role in crime causation and its obligation towards crime prevention by providing some rehabilitative elements and sanctions to help the offender refrain from further crime. And thus I affirm. <laughs> Utilitarianism. Does it indeed say that we need to stop individuals from harming or doing minor harm to others? Uh, the evidence says that in situations where harm is inevitable, we should seek to maximize the most amount or minimize Could you the, most the last amount of harm? two lines of that card, please. Yeah, sure. It says that. The choices between one person inflicting a relatively smaller number of violations and five other persons inflicting so it, relatively smaller. So it does concede that that person would cause violations, correct? I don't think I understand your question. There it's, are violations on both sides. Right. There's a smaller violation. No, but it says violation. that an individual causes those violations, right? Isn't that the text of the car? That an individual causes them? It's, it's, not, just, a, it's not one individual causing either violation, right? It's just there's a conflict of rights. The card says that the individual will cause that violation, right? The individual is opposed to an individual would cause rights violations or a government would cause rights violations. I'm not, I, I am honestly just not sure what you're getting at. The question specifically then, with the, the last card you read talks about economic inequalities and that correlation to violence. Where's the warrant that says if you are impoverished or if you live in an endangered situation, you are more likely to commit crime, right? No, the, the argument is just that there are social conditions that the government does not take responsibility for. I, I understand that, but where's the warrant that says those social conditions lead to crime? It just says that these have led, these are part of crime, cause, this is part of the causation of crime. It's wow. like the sole factor. The argument is just based on empirical studies, I mean, Empirically, right. There so we, we agree that the government has the obligation to take care of certain things. My question is, why does this have to happen in the realms of rehabilitation in the criminal justice system? My argument is that that is the only way that it would be effective. So your your authors talk about a conception of justice through utilitarian lens. Where do they make the argument that that conception of utilitarianism is applied to the state? It talks about ethics between individuals and other individuals. Where does it go to the extra level to apply that to state ethics? Uh, the Ryman evidence and the Hudson evidence in contention too are on point on this question. They both talk about why if we focus on the individual, uh, it acquits the state and it acquits other people of their injustice. It's very specific to uh, why we shouldn't Damn. focus on the individual. The realm of justice you talk about or the realm of morality you talk about, who determines that view? What actor determines what is moral and what is not moral? My argument is just that from an ethical standpoint. Like, it's not like the government's saying, like, we should be No, I, I know what theoretically and philosophically your argument is. My question is, who in government decides or makes the decision of what is normal? I do. No one? Like, they just follow their code of ethics. Right? Okay. Well, okay. So, while Jalad takes some time to craft work, we're going to talk to you. Then. So, first of all, um, did everyone did, did uh did everyone understand the gist of the gist of the affirmative case? And a little bit it's talking a little bit about how rehabilitation might be a good thing, right? Um, so, um, but uh, okay. So the, the affirmative case. Um, let's talk about it first from the perspective of CX, because CX is one of the most important speeches and it's rarely ever given the credit it deserves. CX is where the round is set up, where the judge sees both debaters talking to each other and actually interacting, right? It's when you start to see where the arguments are going. So when you're trying to think strategically about what's going to happen in the round, you first of all look to the questions that are asked in CX. So what topic does Jalan start off asking about? What part of the affirmative case? The util, the util part, which is which card? 
Scheffler. Scheffler, right? Okay, so they talked about this a little uh, a little while. Scheffler is talking about P1, P2, P5. I, I don't know who P is, but I'm assuming it's persons, right? So the Scheffler card is basically talking about why deontology is a bad thing. Who can give me an, uh, give me, uh, an explanation of what deontology is? So we're all on the same page. Yes? Actions are inherently wrong or, is, or inherently right or wrong, and the uh, result of the action is not necessarily where you derive morality. Sure. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Timmons. Everybody's going to have to speak up. Okay. Both yeah. the debaters. One more time. Everybody's answering and asking questions. Sure. Deontology is basically the concept that actions are either inherently moral or immoral, and that the result of the action doesn't necessarily like constitute whether the action itself is moral or immoral. Thank you. Very good. Uh, did ever, was everyone able to hear that? Deontology is the idea that the ends don't justify the means. No matter what murdering one person might get me, I can never do it, even if it would stop a nuclear war or something like that. Deontology is you can't commit morally bad actions, period, no matter what, right? It's a very strict, very conservative kind of like philosophical, philosophical school. What Josh is arguing for is utilitarianism or consequentialism, which just says the ends are all that matter. We need to look at the end. Because even if we're in a situation where one person's going to die or five people are going to die, there's an immoral thing happening no matter what, and we need to minimize that bad, right? Like, utility is just the benefits outweigh the means that makes a good action, right? It's comparing two different types of actions. So the Sheffler card is setting up something, in Josh's case, where he just wants to have a direct debate about whether or not rehabilitation and retribution are better in terms of achieving some sort of moral good, right? It's not about, uh, it's not about being perfectly moral in any sort of sense because now arguments about how you have to be absolutely perfect when it comes to morality don't make sense. We need to do utility and whichever action, rehabilitation or retribution, which is what he's assuming that Jalan is going to defend in the NT, is what the debate should be about. Then, what is the second area that Jalan uh, Jalan jumps to when he's asking a question about the affirmative case. The Hudson card, which is which card in the case? The absolute last one. This is a very good instinct. It's something that you should all remember. Debaters usually, like, like you want to make sure you understand the entire case, right? And especially the end of cases are a lot of times where debaters put the arguments that they like to go for because when you're making arguments, you start at the top and sometimes you run out of time by the time you get to the bottom. So it's good to make sure you understand that. And the Hudson analysis is actually very specific about why rehabilitation is the obligation of the government. That's what Jalan's asking about, right? Okay, so then what is the third, um, what is the third area that Jalan's cross-examination goes into? Well, Raymond, but more specifically, what entity or actor is he talking about? The government, right? Jalan is asking about why the government is bound by the morality that Josh is talking about. Um, so it seems like Jalan is wondering where the morals and like where morality comes into a situation that has to do with the government, where that actor has, um, where, like when that actor becomes a moral actor, right? Because maybe states do things differently than the U.S. Maybe because the government is like meant to protect us, it has different obligations than we as individuals might. In the same way that while I'm not obligated to run into a burning building, a firefighter, we would say, certainly has more of an obligation to do something like that. So um, thinking about these three. Thinking about these three areas that Jalan is asking questions about and trying to tease it to, to nail Josh down and make sure he's fully understanding this competition, all right, the case, sorry, tells us what about, what, like, what do we kind of think Jalan is going to focus on a little bit? Well, he's going to focus on the fact that it's utilitarianism. He's probably got a little bit of a problem with the, the, the Hudson card at the end of the case. And he probably has a different view of what the government's obligations are. Right? We can assume these things. What you should be thinking about in demo rounds is not only who you think is doing the better debating and like trying to think of, well, how are they telling me that the arguments are interacting and things like that, but you also have the unique opportunity to think strategically about what happens during the round. Why is Jalan doing this? Why is Josh reading this card? Why are they answering questions in this way? So as you're trying to flow, make sure that you're trying to process this. And um, I know I've talked for a little while, and I'm going to let Josh Jalan go in a second. But the last thing that I just wanted to say is, like, uh, Josh's case is very straightforward. It's talking very clearly about um, a lot of empiric evidence from meta-studies, which is basically just means 
one, uh, like a couple, a couple of professors or people doing the study just looked at every other study that there was out there that they could find. Well, maybe not every other one, but certainly a lot. So it is a study of studies, right? And Josh is very explicit about how all of the studies that these people examined were um, on the side of the affirmative, and he gives a lot of explicit, uh, a lot of explicit, uh, explicit numbers in contention one. And then he, furthermore, gives a reason to prefer why you have meta studies. And it's important when you're debating to not only say this is my warrant, this is the study I have, but also back up why that is an argument that you were going with, why you think that that is the strongest argument, because any time that you do that. If Jalan stands up and reads a response study saying, well, in this study conducted with 200 people or something like that, um, Jer uh, Josh, sorry, not Jared, um, can very easily just be like, I already told you why mine were better. He's making his job easier in the 1AR, which is a big, uh, big important step for the firm. But that being said, let's see what happens with the NC. Check state violence and inequality. Because of this, I negate. I value a conception of justice that aims to provide equity towards individuals, that recognizes a base of sameness among individuals under the law. Vague claims to morality or justice or forms of normative ethics don't answer these questions. A political professor from Dartmouth and Hampshire College explains the notion of state violence. The violence of law holds that the purpose of the state in its various forms is to preserve itself and its interests. To manage its populations, the state protects those segments of its populations whose interests are thought to conserve its own existence. It abandons those populations that are considered a threat to its existing order. I understand this framework to underlie the structure of liberalism and other forms of politics. This is the fundamental structure of sovereign subject relations in the modern era. In this framework, racialization and racial division are crucial features of politics to sovereign power. The professor further warns and clarifies the process of state violence through distinctions between individuals and the population. The subject population is seen as an unruly because it threatens to unseat those who perceive themselves to be not necessarily in power or on the verge of losing power. This loss can be in the realm of the political, economic, social, or that of a prevailing dominant worldview. There must be some event that is the focal point, the occasion by which the threat is perceived. There is a crucial feature that provides the basis of vulnerability of the population. The unregulated existence of this group is believed to engender potentially detrimental consequences for the larger population. Thus, morality and justice both function as terms to perpetuate abuse because they don't clearly answer questions that address the right of the state, i.e. the affirmative case. Further, their vague debatable concepts make clear a notion of morality that is hard to address. Thus, the standard or criterion is minimizing the violence of law. Giving individuals rights protects the state to stop abuse through the power of these distinctions. First, I contend that uniformity of retribution reduces distinctions on many levels and provides objective punishments. Immanuel Kant explains. It is the just principle of equality, the undeserved evil which anyone commits on another is to be regarded as perpetrated on himself. Hence, it may be said, if you strike another, you strike yourself. If you kill another, you kill yourself. Properly understood is the only principle on which regulating a public court can definitely assign a just penalty. All other standards are wavering and uncertain and on account of other considerations involved in them. They contain no principle conformable to the sentence of pure and strict justice. Regardless of one's status, crimes are uniformly distributed and not distinct among groups. This ensures a responsible use of state power and protects the rights of individuals that are victims against the crime. A crime against an individual is a crime against the public. Second, I contend that rehabilitation is an oppressive use of state power that perpetuates the violence of law. Discourse is key in painting the picture of a threat in today's content. The government calls this rehabilitation. Author of the political language of helping professors, Murray Edelman, explains. To label an authority relationship tyrannical is an exhortion to oppose it. It is not a simple description. The chief function of any political term is to marshal public support or opposition. Some terms do so overtly, but the more potent ones, including deals by, used by professionals, do so covertly portraying a power relationship is a helping one. 
When the power of professionals over other people is at stake, the language employed implies that the professional has to ascertain who is dangerous, sick, or inadequate. That he knows how to render them harmless, rehabilitate them, or both. And this procedures for diagnosis and for treatment are too specialized for the lay public to understand or judge them. A patient with a sore throat is anxious for the problem itself circumscribes to the doctor's authority. But its legitimacy is linguistically created or reinforced. It is the course of ambiguity in the relationship. Edelman further paints the picture in the context of rehab. How they are classified depends on the assumptions of the observer, not upon the behavior he is judging. Some psychologists reject the reinforcement of deviant behavior rationale on the ground that it pays no attention to all the special cognitive and symbolizing factors of the human mind. In this view, the treatment is self-serving political repression, rationalized as rehabilitative to solve the consciousness of those in authority and in public. Thus, rehabilitation serves as an extended function of the state to violence and suppress its control on populations. An emphasis on rehabilitation makes citizens puppets of the state, thus you negate. Now on to the affirmative case. If you go to the top of the affirmative case, specifically, I'm fine with the framework of using competing ground and using comparative worlds. That's fine. My criticisms of rehabilitation extend all around the evidence because it shows you that the problem with rehabilitation is that the state uses it to deceive members within its community on the guise of it helping individuals. Many individuals are cut off from access to a lot of the methodology and what's being used to rehabilitate individuals, so we never actually know when someone's rehabilitated. We only know when some public authority or some public figure has said this, and this is pretty dehumanizing. Then off of the lip scene, the lip scene rehab evidence, or the justification for consequentialism, this is right above the sanctions argument. First, if you call the evidence, I believe this is the Scheffler analysis, it sits clearly in the last two sentences. The choices between a person and, a, and five other people inflicting some small form of a minor abuse and five other people trading off for some rights conflict. This argument clearly shows you that it's a justification for punishment. It admits that one person will commit some minor harm on other individuals, so the own justification for consequentialism in the affirmative states that we should punish individuals that would do harm to others. That's an automatic reason to negate. But furthermore, when you're looking towards these concepts of justice, they don't give you any specific notion of how the state should execute these problems or how the state should execute morality. It gives you some vague figure. Thus, you prefer the rehabilitation arguments coming off of the negative figures. Then, jump down to the Huntsman evidence. It's terrible. One, it doesn't give you a specific reason for why poverty equals crime. Two, it doesn't tell you the significant impact that these variables have on crime. And three, it doesn't say rehab ought to be used in the criminal justice system. It just says that we should help serve the public. That's what public welfare programs are for. Then, group the arguments about juvenile rehabilitation and rehab in the system. Goodman explains um, the impact of rehabilitation. 5,000 children in Pennsylvania were found guilty, and 2,000 of them jailed by corrupt judges who received kickbacks from the builders and owners of private prisons. They were given forced rehabilitation. Take the story of Jamie Quinn. When she was 14 years old, she was in prison for a year. She described the incident. She got into an argument with her friends, and she was slapped. The 11th month imprisonment had a devastating impact on her. She continued cutting herself and was given forced medication. This 5,000 yard impacts argument gives you the biggest quantifiable impact in terms of links to all the rehabilitation arguments. Everyone ready? Jalon, which piece of evidence do you read against the affirmative case that indicts rehabilitation from a meta-analytic standpoint? The arguments coming out of the Goodman analysis give you an example of 5,000 individuals that were harmed from rehabilitation. Okay, so you do not respond to the colon evidence that indicates that we should prefer meta-analytic studies, correct? No. My and arguments come from a philosophical level on rehab that applies under the negative framework. How is a story about some chick a philosophical whoa, perspective whoa, whoa. on rehab? <laughs> we should be respectful to the needs of the victim. It was 5,000 individuals, an 11-year-old girl who was hurt through the concept of forced rehabilitation. It's unchecked because the government, who functioned as the judges, 
were receiving financial okay. aid how to does rehabilitate that, people. How does that interact with the 169 meta-analytic uh, studies that were studied under the meta-analysis that indicate that of all of those studies, there was uh, a 20 to 30 percent reduction in recidivism? Because this gives you people to actually wait under your consequences. So the people in my studies are not people? You don't have people. You just have numbers that so, say percents. I give you 5,000 people. Isn't that a number? No, that's <laughs> it's, it's not a, a number, number, but it's not a number of persons. <laughs> if you want Wait, to so 5,000 children is not a number of people. What is No, 5, that's what I'm saying. Mean? I'm saying the numbers you reference in your meta study are not people. They're what just are percentages. They? They're what? Percentages. 20%, 30% of what? People. So people don't. <laughs> <laughs> your, argument, your argument is that. You rehabilitate them. My argument says government rehabilitation doesn't work because it allows for perpetual state abuse. And that's based on that's 5,000 people. people. No, Not that's based also based off of the Edelman evidence you're ignoring out of the NC. All right, so let's talk about that then. Uh, can you show me where the evidence that you says paints the picture clear in the context of rehab uses the word rehabilitation? Rehabilitation is used in the first card. So the one that puts it into the context of rehabilitation doesn't actually use the word rehabilitation. Well, it's the same art article, and when rehab is introduced, this elaborates on it. All right, so let's talk about this first Edelman evidence. What is the warrant in this evidence? Or there, what is are, the there are three different warrants for the Edelman evidence. It's talking about a patient. Is the argument, would it be fair to say that the general summary of the argument is that under rehabilitation, um, it allows the government to decide who is and who isn't uh, well, and it allows no. Them to that's them. only that's only one argument, Josh. Okay, There's so two what's other the other warrants for rehab? What's the other? The second warrant for rehab is that specifically, once the government manages these populations, uh -huh. it's hard for individuals to distinct if someone actually was rehabilitated because of the authority that other individuals within government had. Okay. And you want the third one? Uh, no, nah, we'll, I'll read it. Okay, so, um, anyway, so, let's talk about that neg the negative speech a little bit. First of all, um, Jalan's case is about the state, right? So we kind of saw that coming in CX, right? So you want to make sure that you're, like, seeing how they're weaving the same consistent story or kind of argument throughout, throughout the debate round, right? You're not making separate arguments in the first speech or the second speech. CX is not something that should be totally divorced from the speeches you're making. You need to make sure that you're doing this in a, like, or the goal, it, the goal at the end of workshop is to be able to do all of these things in a very consistent, coherent, developmental, uh, developmental fashion. Jalan starts off in CX by planting the seed of a couple of different arguments, and it starts to develop into much larger case positions, his understanding of the way that the affirmative case interacts with the negative case, and so on. But let's talk about, let's talk about the negative case a little bit. The negative case talks a lot about state violence. What does Jalan mean when he's talking about the violence of the state? Like, is he talking about like actual like wars or like any sort of physical violence or what? Dan. No, he's talking about, louder. He's talking more louder. about like he's talking more about like oppression and racism. He's and talking about oppression, which is most specifically ha uh, viewable through racism, right? The framework in the negative case is talking about how state violence or the state or the government is only using its power in a way to secure its own power, right? The state will only act in ways that further entrench itself, right? I.e., it will only support the people who support it, right? So the state then makes the people who are not part of its power base, who disagree with the state, who are outside of it, um, into its enemies. And it uses violence, not, not violence like assault or battery or anything like that, but something very different in the sense of oppression. And like Jalan is contextualizing this in the sense of uh, racism as well as other types of discrimination that happen against groups, right? So Jalan's framework is talking about how we need to minimize the violence of the law. He's not talking about how police, uh, police brutality or anything like that. He's talking very much more specifically about the way in which the law is applied that restrict uh, that uh, sorry that um, takes people's rights away, um, in the sense that disrespecting people's rights, oppressing them, leading to them not being able to escape these cycles of poverty and violence that he's describing. So minimizing the violence of the law is talking about how the law needs to be applied equally and respect everyone's rights and not allow the state 
to kind of do whatever it wants because the law is what guides the state. The state can't violate the law. So what Delon wants to do is make the law something that actually protects everyone's rights equally. And so then his contention is going to show how treating, uh, treating punishment as a, or not punishment, but treating criminals uh, through retribution is going to minimize the violence of the law. It's going to minimize the ability of the state to manipulate or oppress or uh, excommunicate or do like all of these awful, like do, do a lot of these oppressive maneuvers that it does to its people. So then, in the contentions, how many contentions does Jalan have? Okay, who can tell me what the first contention says? Someone? For, yes. Uniformity, uh, uniformity gives you like an objective uh, basis of punishment, so you no longer have ex exceptions for people. Okay, uniformity gives you an objective basis for punishment. What that means is if the law says, if the law says you stole, you lose a hand, right? If everyone who steals loses a hand, there's no way for the state to manipulate that in a way which oppresses people who are not part of its power base if everyone's treated equally. This is kind of when we were talking about the zero tolerance policies last night in the topic analysis, right? So um, that is very important. Who is the author who uh, wrote that card? Uh, Kant, right? Like that is Immanuel Kant, right? So like, don't just think that you need to have art like articles or cards coming from very recent, uh, very recent things. If you find something that you think is relevant, and you can make that argument, you should definitely talk to your lab leaders and try it out, right? But second of all, his second contention is the contention that Josh talks about in CX, right? Josh is asking about what cards? Edelman. Edelman. Edelman? Okay. Uh, but Edelman, Edelman is talking about how the state can manipulate rehabilitation in order to further oppress people that it doesn't, uh, that it wants to disempower, right? That it wants to keep uh, keep out of the ability to overthrow the state, to bring it, to have a new revolution or something like that. Or to, well, I mean, not a revolution, but I mean, it, rehabilitation is a means of the state controlling people, right? And what he's talking about is the role of a, uh, the role of a clinician, the role of a doctor, the role of a rehabilitator, and the fact that they and the the, the part of their authority influences the way that like people are treated and it's not consistent and allows the state to manipulate and oppress, uh, oppress the people who are supposedly being rehabilitated through things ostensibly uh, Jalan, Jalan, uh, Jalan is talking in uh, like, it, like Jalan is talking about the theory but like an example of this might be people who are in uh, institutionalized but never allowed to leave right because the state is ultimately in power and the common people can't check it because doctors have a doctoral degree and so they know better than us right but the problem is the doctors are the state so the state can just do what it wants again right the law isn't the state. Um, the last thing i want to say after having gone through the negative case is josh's cx focuses very clearly on the offense that jalan reads about why rehabilitation is is worse than uh, retribution so the majority of CX is Josh asking about, first of all, the, meta, uh, the, the, the types of impacts that were coming. So first of all, those meta studies we were talking about earlier, right? Whether or not Jalan addressed those or did any weighing. And then second of all, trying to uh, do a lot of, uh, find out where the comparison is between the evidence, the Goodman evidence, sorry, that Jalan reads on the affirmative case, talking about why uh, the, the number of kickback, kickbacks coming to judges on the rehabilitative systems and private, uh, private, uh, private prison systems but also the Edelman analysis. So it seems like Josh's strategy in the, a, 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 the one AR is going to be along which lines? Who can, who can venture a guess, thinking strategically? What do you think Josh is going to holistically try to do in the round? What's up? Outweigh. All right. He's going, to, he's going to try and outweigh those pieces of evidence, right? Because he's trying to get very specific answers from Jalan about what these, what these cards are talking about, what the terminal impact is, how that impact works. And Josh's case is very specific about a comparison in the same way that Jalan's is. And Josh is just trying to figure out how to do that. So depending on whichever framework he goes for, I mean, there are guesses that he could potentially go for either, but it seems like Josh is probably going to be going for the affirmative framework and then just trying to outweigh Jalan's arguments and talk about why the quality of his impacts and the quality of his evidence in his mind is better, right? So it's going to be a question of which framework do you use, first of all? So how is Josh going to deal with the negative framework talking about how we need to constrain the government rather than purely look at a rights-based perspective that the affirmative talks about? And then second, why rehabilitation is going to be fundamentally better than retribution. So let's see the one AR and Um, 
this kind of is a quick roadmap. We're actually going to be starting on the affirmative case, the Ryman evidence, uh, which was the second to last piece of evidence read. And then we will be going back to the top of the affirmative case, the framework down, negative case. Is everyone ready? The concession of the Ryman evidence is game ending. Retribution masks the root cause of crime. It ignores the fact that crime is not an individual phenomenon, but rather a result of social, economic, and political factors. By focusing solely on the individual wrongdoer, retribution makes solving crime impossible because it acquits society of any wrongdoing. This is also a turn to the negative case. Even if he wins his framework, when retribution masks the root cause of crime, it only gives the state more power because they have the ability to do whatever they want and shift focus away from them and place it on the individual. It also, the other impact is that the 1AC recidivism impacts will always outweigh the negative, even if the negative decreases more recidivism in the short term because a rehabilitative approach highlights the underlying problems with crime. I am the only person that can solve the root cause of crime. So now let's go to the top of the affirmative case. To be honest with you, I have no clue what his answer to Scheffler says because it's not at all responsive to the evidence that I read. His argument is that there's uh, no notion of how the state uses morality. Again, irrelevant. My argument is not a question of morality. My argument is just the state doing what is best for the overall amount of citizens. He also says that it's clear that it justifies punishment. I'm not sure what piece of evidence he's reading, but my evidence has nothing to do with justifying punishment. My evidence says that when there's a situation where lives are in conflict, we should choose to protect the most amount of rights, not that we should punish other people. Now go to the contention level. Let's talk about this Goodman evidence. First, the fact that he's conceded the Lipsy and Cullen evidence means that it's entirely irrelevant. His argue, uh, uh, this Goodman evidence is irrelevant. His argument that my studies are talking about percentages is not and not people, it frankly doesn't make any sense. The percentages are made up of people uh, in the same way that he's talking about 5,000 children, but somehow that's different than my evidence that also uses numbers. But insofar as he's conceded the Cullen evidence that indicates that you should prefer meta-analytic studies, you can extend the first justification that says meta-analysis can accurately assess statistical significance by summing effect size across a sample of studies. This also means that he does not do any weighing into his evidence, and he's conceded mine, so you should prefer the Landenberger analysis, which indicates that rehabilitation in comparison to sanctions, this is the only evidence that compares retribution with rehabilitation read in this debate, and it says that on average it reduces recidivism rates by 20 to 30 percent when we rehabilitate people. Now let's go to the negative case. On the first piece of evidence that he reads, you can turn this. Rehabilitation does the exact opposite. It tries to help people back into society instead of excluding them as retribution does by keeping them away from society. That's exactly what happens when we put people in prison. We are labeling people as people that stay outside of the normal society. Then go down to the contention. You can group all of his, uh, his arguments, specifically the Edelman evidence and the Kant evidence. The argument that rehabilitation justifies assault is based on a C.S. Lewin science fiction novel, not reality, Rubin writes. The concern that a rehabilitative theory of punishment would authorize extreme techniques of manipulation is a political fantasy. Its earliest articulation is in a science fiction novel by C.S. Lewis. The criticism is almost certainly false when considered in the context of American corrections. It has always been the doctrine espoused by the most progressive elements in the correctional establishment. The rehabilitative approach that followed were generally more humane and expressed a sincere concern for the felon as an individual. If one wanted to catalog the worst abuses in American corrections, one would certainly choose the convict leader leasing system, the plantation model prisons, not those prisons that were organized along rehabilitative lines. Also, desert does not correspond to appropriate punishment, and the government cannot ensure that everyone gets what they deserve, which also turns the negative case because it ensures that the state has more power, Rubin concludes. Concepts that belong to the realm of personal morality, such as dessert, cannot be translated into that policy in the manner that dessert theory uh, assert. The concept of dessert is much too broad. It would be nice if people got what they deserved, but no one deserves to get cancer, and yet that still happens. Okay. So, um, what, what do we think happened in the 1AR? Anyone? Anyone have a comment? Okay, cool. Sweet. Uh, so let's let's talk about where Josh starts off. What is the first what is the first argument that Josh that Josh goes for? Uh, 
Ryman, the Ryman evidence, which is the first card and second contention. And Ryman is talking about how it, like individual crimes or the criminal activity that we are talking about is not solely caused by individuals, right? Ryman says that there are social, economic, as well as political factors that all go into crime. For instance, people who might grow up in uh, certain communities are more predisposed towards crime because of certain realities about where they live. For instance, it might, it, it might be a lot harder to avoid criminal activity when you grow up in a place very saturated with gang activity, right? These are actual real factors that Josh is talking about through Ryman that are very important, right? So, Josh does, what does Josh do after he extends the evidence and re-explains what Ryman is saying? Someone, someone other than Zeke. You answered it, right? Yes. So he, uh, he weighs, he weighs it compared to like the other, the Goodman evidence saying that since it solves the root, it solves for the root cause, it's always going to outweigh. And he also says that it functions under the uh, negative framework. So it also, even if you, even if you lose the out framework, it still is a root cause argument that solves under the neg. Correct. Very good. Uh, this illustrates two important points about debate rounds. First of all, as a debater, it's especially important uh, that Jalan and, Jalan and Josh have begun to collapse the round down into what the important arguments are. This usually starts happening in the 1AR once the affirmative case, or affirmative debater rather, makes the decision about what arguments he is going to go for. The second, and so like you can see that he's collapsing the round down, and what I mean by that is he is comparing evidence in different parts of the cases to like very directly against each other, right? So it's very important that Josh is saying things like Ryman is uh, Ryman is always going to be solving or leading to a better outcome than the Goodman analysis because it's solving the root cause of the problem. But second of all, and just more technically, like technically and a little bit more obviously, Josh is doing a very good job of numbering. The, the implications of his extension, right? This is something that's very important when you're doing debate rounds because it's very easy for judges to get lost if you were just saying and, and when you're transitioning between arguments or also it does this, also it does this, next it does this. Starting off, uh, when you're giving your speeches, you should try to be as direct as possible. It's very important to be, to, to be saying, this has two direct implications for the round, or the impacts for the round are this. Because we as judges always love hearing you debaters tell us which arguments are important, right? And it's not just saying, my Ryman analysis is very, very important. It's saying, this impacts to your decision calculus as a judge for two reasons. First of all, it turns the NC. Second of all, it solves the root problem of this card. That's a very important skill, and it's something that a lot of debaters think that they get past after like a certain point in their career or something like that, and that they that they, that they they can stop doing it because they the judges their ju the judges who are watching them have been judging for a while and they'll know what's up and everything like that. But I guarantee you, everyone on staff will love you if you number your impacts and are very clear about the way you're explaining this. And Josh and Jalan are doing a good job of that in this round so far. But then Josh is also going. Uh, going for the affirmative framework, he's talking about how we just simply need to look at, at who helps more people, but he's also keeping the background strategy of his Ryman analysis impacts to the negative framework. So it's, if he's losing the utility Scheffler analysis because of some of the responses uh, that Jalan made, he still has a backup plan. Then lastly and finally, Josh goes on to the, affirm, uh, to the negative case and doesn't uh, and spends the majority of his time talking about the contention. He's being very directly comparative about whether rehabilitation or retribution is important, which is very, it's just a very good thing to do in a round because he's focusing on the main source of the class. He's not trying to avoid an argument. He's making it so that he and Jalan can talk about the facts straight up, right? They, they all have a lot of evidence going for them that's talking about a very similar thing, which is important, right? You want to isolate down to an issue that actually there are two sides of. Jalan is very, is very like, is very clearly showing that like rehabilitation is an extenuation of state oppressive power. Like, it allows the state to do things that it should not and deprive people of rights. And Josh is saying, no, rehabilitation is actually preferable. Rehabilitation is not manipulation. And the government can't make sure that everyone gets all of their rights. That's what he ends his speech with, about, with the card talking about how no one deserves cancer, but some people get it and the government just can't stop. So there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of moving pieces. Josh has put a lot of different pieces in play in the one A in the one AR. He's made choices which are very it's very important to make choices and to commit to a strategy in the one AR. He doesn't try to extend everything from the AC, but rather he very pointedly goes to bring the round to a discussion of rehabilitation versus retribution, and he's making sure to maintain uh, out in case his strategy kind of doesn't work as well as he hopes. So let's see what that what the NR can do on. Everyone ready? Yes. Cool. Josh has always been a good friend of mine. He should heed my advice. 
Stop taking so many trips to Malibu at Pepperdine and stop calling game over in the 1 AR. He's made three big drops. The first one is coming off the count analysis. He tries to group the two Ruben turns who think they're responsive to count. The problem is, is that Kant tells you that these charges that are given to individuals through retributive punishment are all equal and uniform. The Rubin evidence says, or it tries to explain itself as to why desert is something that isn't justified. That doesn't respond to the argument that Kant's giving. Kant is telling you that when an individual hurts another individual, that they are harming the public at large, and that the only way you can justify this under the laws of the state to not distinguish them is by giving them that punishment. Once an individual is punished, another individual needs to receive appropriate punishment. That is taking off the arguments off of the uh, Rubin analysis. Then if you go towards the second Rubin analysis off Kant, this is the one that talks about the rehabilitation not being manipulative, not being a fantasy. Even though he's winning the arguments about the meta studies, the problem is, is that that doesn't mean my evidence goes away. That's just the reason as to why you should look, look towards his evidence at decreasing recidivism. But the fact still is, there's a narrative given from the Goodman analysis that tells you an individual was harmed. This directly answers that Rubin analysis because it tells you that these treatments were humane. It says it in the evidence. This is a turn to that analysis. Then, off of the first group of analysis that is read, off of the uh, Edom analysis, Josh just isn't understanding the argument. The argument specifically is, is that the government has too many people in positions of authority that the public trusts to be able to understand how rehab works. This gives the government the unchecked ability to be able to implement rehab at whoever it wishes to without some form of consent or objection from the state or people within the state. But then, go specifically to the Falguni analysis. Just like he didn't understand the questions in cross-examination, he's not understanding the questions, not understanding the warrants and that evidence. You can extend Falguni 1, who shows you that the state makes these distinctions within different groups of people, and that this is how we're able to harm people, and this is how we're able to make rights against it. If we treated everyone the same, it would be hard to distinct between these groups of people. But these distinctions are key to these rights abuses. Then you can extend the file Guni to evidence. That tells you that you need to designate someone as a threat in order to be able to create these problems, or because we need some people to go against the threat to support the side. Now we're going to talk about uniqueness for a second. Uniqueness is very important because if you don't have any uniqueness, then you don't have a good, good impact. And if you don't have that, you can't win the round through disadvantages. If you go back to the end of the speech, now we're going to the AC at the bottom, specifically off of the, the Huntsman analysis. Josh is extending the Ryman evidence above it that says rehab is always better than retribution because it masks these problems. But he presumes that in the affirmative world, there are no prisons, there are no jails. That distinction will always be there. That's not unique. There will always be incarceration. There will always be jails. The problem is, is that the warrants the Ryman evidence falls off of that talks about how we mask these problems is met with embedded clash off of the Huntsman analysis. That argument showed you that there's no correlation between poverty leading to crime. There's no correlation between these geographic areas leading to any crime. So the premise that the Ryman analysis is based off of that says these arguments ultimately mask these problems isn't true. Even if these problems do exist, he's missing the link to that these problems cause crime. So that extension is irrelevant. Then go to the evidence he's weighing with the meta-analysis. The meta I will concede he's winning those statistics. He is winning those arguments. The problem is, under a consequentialist framework, under the arguments he labels at the top of the case, we have to weigh rights abuses. My Goodman evidence doesn't go away. It just, in comparison to his evidence, it just shows he recidivizes more people. But Goodman tells you that under rehab programs, 5,000 individuals have been harmed. 5,000 lives have been harmed. A female has been harmed. But under the statistics Josh give you, you don't know any quantifiable number. You don't know 20% of what. So you're always going to prefer my evidence because it's clearly going to be showing you a clear cut specific picture. In the next speech, he's going to get up and say prefers meta-analysis. His meta-analysis only speaks to lowering recidivist rates. It does not speak to how many people were actually affected. So I do went under that consequential standard. Then go up to the rank, go up to the Lipson analysis, which talks specifically about this issue about the card. The card he reads, it's Scheffler specifically. The end of Scheffler says that we need to choose between the rights conflicts of one individual and five people when one individual is responsible for the harm of those other people. That was clearly read on the card in the last two sentences of the card. That is a justification for punishment. So you always vote negative in the case of looking towards consequentialism because consequentialism commits you to harming an individual that could potentially harm others. That's a reason to vote negative under the affirmative framework. So then the round becomes really clear. 
First, you're looking to the negative case. The Falguni analysis shows you that justice and morality are ways the state uses perpetuating and shifting philosophies to violate rights abuses. Remember, Josh Roberts values values of conception of justice, but the framework consistently shows you why some vague conception of justice or morality that he doesn't explain extends and commits more rights abuses. That was never answered in the last speech. That's right above the Falguni analysis, and that's right, thoroughly explained through those warrants. So you're never looking to anything off of the AC because that only perpetuates rights abuses because of the volume he has. The Edelman evidence shows you clearly that because of all the authorities in the government, the public can never consent. So the problem he has ultimately is that even if people are going through these rehabilitation programs, they'll never be able to stop these rights abuses. And the next turn, he's going to get up and extend the Ryman analysis. The problem is Ryman doesn't win because in the neg world, there won't be people in rehab through the criminal justice system. And the actor will always be present, so I'm the only one with the unique advantage to the impact. Okay, so Jalan does a does a lot of good uh, good work in that round. Jalan, first of all, rebuilds the for, uh, rebuilds the, the negative case and contextualizes his impact facts. That is something that's very important in the NR. A lot of times, debaters in the NR jump around and don't have a clear picture. Jalan very clearly is going for the negative case as well as going into going into and engaging in the clash that jo uh, Josh is talking about. However, the way in which Jalan does it is, 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 is like exactly what we need to be doing because a lot of times. Judges, we as judges will see the NR mimic exactly what the AR went over, and uh, debaters will jump around and follow, well, he said this, so I'll respond with this. But Jalan is making sure to establish his frameworks first and go for his case, which is, which is going to be important if that's the decision you're going for, and tell his story. He's not allowing Josh to dictate the way in which he's organizing his speech, which is important, and then he's going into indicting the, uh, indicting the arguments that Josh makes in the last round. So, we kind of we kind of see the extension of the Falguni evidence, which I didn't have the name of in my, in my last comment section. But so that becomes like that's still remaining an issue, right? So uh, so the affirm the affirmative and negative cases are both talking about some sort of rights protections. How do we protect the most people's rights? The affirmative is being a little bit uh, is being a little bit more broad in terms of talking about just utility, and we are talking about solely the number of people whose rights we are protecting. That is what's important for Josh. Whereas Jalan is doing a uh, is doing a lot of work and a good job to justify why we need to talk about why we need to be talking about the state uh, the state's violence and minimizing the violence of law, right? So then we see the extension of the Kant analysis. And one thing that I need to point out to you guys is a lot of times debaters will group things, right? But you need to be thinking critically about whether those groupings actually uh, actually respond. Now, whether or not the whether or not the Rubin or Rubin or Rubin analysis that Josh reads against the NC actually responds to Kant, or whether it's just talking about uh, retribution in general and therefore saying rehabilitation is better, is a is a question up to you guys as judges. But Jalan does a very good job of explaining why Kant wouldn't apply to it, why that uh, why that critique would not apply to what Jalan is saying in Kant, and why retribution is the only way to uniformly treat people. And maintaining a consistent message, and he's making sure to give you clear offense for him to look for. Then he goes for the Edelman analysis, talking about why rehabilitation gives the state too much power and takes the power away from the people, therefore allowing for the rights to be further, uh, further trampled. Finally, on the affirmative case, Jalan is doing a great job that I think all of you need to do, and he's developing his arguments from the NC. Um, Josh made it. Uh, Josh is making his argument about how meta-analysis is very important, and Jalan comes right back and he says, uh, he says, I'm not talking about percentages. I'm talking about actual numbers. We don't know where these percentages are coming from, and this is an argument Jalan made at the end of the Goodman analysis when he was also quantifying the impacts of Goodman, and he said he has the biggest quantified impact in the round, and that means he has the impact with the, the largest number of people attached to it rather than just a percentage, right? So J uh, Josh is going to be talking about how all of his analysis comes up with 30%, uh, 30 or 20%, and uh, it's a very important numbers coming out of the Lipsy the Lips analysis, whereas Jalan's argument is that his impact is more important because we actually know how many people were harmed. It's not a, it, we don't just have a percentage without the number that that is a percentage of, right? This is very important when you guys are having debates, not only to be extending like 
your argument of the Goodman analysis, right? But to be talking about why the impact coming out of the Goodman analysis, or the impact coming out of the meta studies, is uh, is the best impact. It's the impact that is most relevant. It's the impact that's the biggest. And I'm sure your lab leaders will be working with you on how to compare impacts. But this is a very good example of a debate round in which they are being explicitly comparative on a couple of fronts. First of all, they're talking about the best way and the most salient rights to protect. That's the framework debate where Jalan is talking about minimizing state violence and Josh is trying to be more broad about the util utilitarian perspective. The second, uh, the second issue where they're directly comparing things is talking about whether rehabilitation or retribution is important under both frameworks. Both of them are impacting to the affirmative and negative in, in case that one of the strategies doesn't work so if they have a backup, they have all of their bases covered. And third and finally, they're, they're being clear about the clash on the impact level and talking about why their particular impacts to each standard are the most salient ones and the ones that, that the judge should consider. It allows the judge to actually have arguments and understand how the debaters see that the round is interacting and it makes your job a lot easier rather than people just extending a bunch of cards without giving their own analysis, their own interpretation of what those cards do and therefore the judge is left at the end of the round with about 30 minutes or left taking about 30 minutes at the end of the round to try and decide and decipher how all of these cards go together. Josh and Jalan are making a lot of arguments, but they're also doing a great job at making sure that you are understanding all of the arguments that you're making and that they're perfectly contextualized to the strategies that they're, that they're making them on. So let's see the 2AR and what Josh's strategy at the end of All right, starting in the same place as the 1AR, it's going to be pretty much the same order. Is everyone ready? The only reason I called game over in the 1AR is because I call him like I see him. His concession <laughs> of the Ryman evidence in the 1AR is still uh, as much of a game over issue. The reason why there is nothing on Todd's flow and nothing on my flow is because he still hasn't answered the argument. He has conceded the Ryman evidence that says retribution masks the root cause of crime. It ignores the fact that crime is not an individual phenomenon, but rather a result of social, economic, and political factors. By focusing solely on the individual wrongdoer, retribution makes solving other impacts impossible and other crime impossible because it acquits society of any wrongdoing. He's also conceded that even if he wins every other argument in the debate, including his framework, I still win the debate because it outweighs on two levels. The first is that it means that when we look at retributivism and we use that as our standard of punishment, it increases the state's power because it allows them to acquit their cells of any wrongdoing and focus solely on the individual. And, and the second impact that he also concedes in his last speech is that it means I'm always going to be winning the recidivism debate because even if he's right that retribution solves recidivism in the short term, it does not solve the long term root cause of the problem because it ignores the actual cause of the problem. Now let's go to the AC framework. He is still misunderstanding my argument. The Scheffler evidence does not say we punish people who commit rights violations. It says that when we're put in a situation where rights are going to be violated either way, we take the action that protects the most amount of rights. It could be a governmental decision, for example, where they have to decide to use nuclear weapons or to not use nuclear weapons, which would save the most amount of lives. These are not examples of crime where we would punish people. It's an example of making a calculated decision. So you can extend the criterion as the protection of rights. On the meta-analysis, this debate is game over. He's right that the Goodman evidence still exists, but it only exists as an exception to the rule, not the rule itself. I guarantee you, and we'll bet uh, uh, anything, that the 169 studies that were covered had thousands of more than the 5,000 people from Philadelphia that he mentions. And so that means that insofar as he's considered you prefer meta-analytic studies, and only my evidence is specific to the conflict in the resolution as it compares retribution and rehabilitation. It says that 30% of the people who were rehabilitated never committed a crime again, which means that I'm the only one stopping recidivism. Now to the Kant evidence and the Edelman evidence. First, the reason Jalan only vaguely references the Edelman evidence without extending a warrant is because this evidence could literally not be worse on the question of rehabilitation. It doesn't use the word except once, and he's also conceded my argument, which is pretty good, that said if that he actually looked at some empirical examples and not just the exception to the rule like his Goodman evidence, he would see that rehabilitation is actually the much more humane punishment. He's conceded the last part of the Rubin evidence, which indicates that if we were to catalog the worst abuses in America, 
American correction facilities, it would be those that used retribution, because those are the ones that are increasing the violence against citizens. So under my criterion, I'm winning the recidivism debate, and under his criterion, I'm winning because he is increasing state power. So just a couple of quick comments before you guys um, take your time to start writing your ideas. And please don't start writing or anything just yet. Like, let's just talk really quick. Um, there's a few things I'd like to say. First of all, Josh, Josh once again, is going for that competitive, that, that competitive debate. So he's doing the same thing in the first speech. He's talking about rehabilitation versus retribution. He's doing the same thing as he did in his first rebuttal. He's doing the same thing in the last speech. It's very important that you guys maintain a consistent strategy, right? A consistent strategy. You commit to that strategy. Josh is not trying to jump around arguments, but he's doing exactly what Mr. Timmons talked about, and they're both engaging each other directly on the issues. They're not trying to extend two sentences out of the framework and saying, this is no longer relevant. They're talking about why their impacts are very real, why they're winning on both of the frameworks, and they're being comparative in terms of those impact levels. The last thing that I want to point out, and that both of them did uh, did a job, that, uh, did a good job on that you should take away from, is the way that they refresh you with the issues at the end of their speeches, right? Jalan, Jalan goes through and talks about why he's winning the negative case. He goes through and references all of the cards that you need in, the, in order to vote negative off of the negative case. Then he talks about why he has offense going to the affirmative case and why that offense is best in terms of the affirmative case. Josh is doing the same thing, but he's a little bit more pressed for time than the 2AR, so it's a, little, it, it, it's a little bit more as the speech goes, both of which are fine, but you should be trying to be as clear as possible about what you're doing. He first of all goes for the affirmative case. He's talking about why the affirmative case is the best way in which to protect people's rights. He's going to be always doing, he's going to be through rehabilitation, first for the Ryman evidence, and then second of all, because of the meta-ethics analysis that he is talking about. So first of all, Ryman is saying that rehabilitation is the only one that views crime that's caused by social conditions exterior to just the individual. It's not just the individual's fault. And then second of all, he's going, he's explaining why that might or might not link to the negative case, and then he's going for the Lipsy analysis. Both of them have a lot of offense coming at the end of the round. And what you should do when you're trying to decide, uh, when, when you're writing your RFD, so you're going to decide rather than trying to decide, uh, when you're writing your RFD, you need to consider a couple of things. First of all, when you make a decision, when you make a decision in the round, you, you should be taking this as seriously as possible. If you had to justify this to someone who this was their last debate round in their career or something, and one of the one of them had to win and one of them had to lose, take it seriously. Like because the more seriously you take it, the more valuable these rounds are as a as a teaching tool. But then second of all, start off by asking yourself the question of which framework am I, looking, am I using to evaluate the round? Is it more important that we go through the affirmative or the negative case? And then once you've established which framework you think uh, a debater is winning, whether it's affirmative or negative, make sure you're trying try to consider and look, identify all of the arguments you see as linking to that framework and decide which one you think provides the best link into that standard, whether or not it's through the affirmative criterion or through the negative, whether it, and whether or not you're deciding based on those arguments based on the implicit weighing that they did about quantification versus meta-analysis or, um, or about solving the problem of social causes or going through the ability of the state to manipulate people and oppress them through a, an inescapable process. So take some time, take it seriously, write it down on a different sheet of paper again. You don't want to write it down in your flow in case you need your flow. And, um, so let's just give one last hand for Josh and Jalan.